Welcome to The Brand Moat, the podcast where each month we bring you inspirational stories from global brand leaders who share how to build your brand and future-proof your business. I'm Julie Slater. I start every episode with big ideas and wrap up each show with key insights so you can focus on taking action. And in case you're wondering, why do we call this show The Brand Moat? Well, just like a castle, your moat protects you from outsiders and the competition. When the idea is applied to your company, it helps you maintain your competitive advantage. Your moat may be a feature, some tech magic or marketing secret sauce, but we think your strongest moat is your brand. This podcast is all about that. This month, founder and CEO of United Esports, Felix LaHaye, joins me to talk about making valuable connections between brands and esports audiences. Felix has that rare combination of having a fast start as well as a lot of experience. He and his team are veterans of thousands of campaigns, and his personal accolades include making Forbes 30 under 30 list, Inc.'s 30 under 30, and being named on Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. He's known as an innovator, and we're about to find out why. Here's my conversation with Felix LaHaye. Thank you so much, Felix, for joining me today. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us, I guess just to start, about esports, what exactly, I guess to the general person, you know, what? how would you explain esports? To sure. People? Esports is the media and events that surround professional gaming and professional video gaming, should I say. So it is a enormous cultural phenomenon whereby people are getting together and watching and participating in either small or large or very large competitions around video games that are the competitive element. So it can be played in a college, it can be played at your friend's house, so it can be played at the Staples Center in arenas with 80,000 people that fill out in a few hours. So it's pretty big. And when did all this begin? Was it like the 90s? Yeah, it's about 20 years old at this point, but we are really much at the inflection point. A few years ago, Esports really started uh, to sell out stadiums. You know, there's a- around 400 million people who uh, watch esports in the world right now. But right now, we're at a point where, although people have been working in, in it for the past few years, it's now finally become more of a buzzword. So, esports in its current state, depending on who you ask, it's either in the bottom of the second or the top of the third inning. So, it's pretty early, but the game already has an identity. How did you get involved in esports to begin with? So I've been playing games my entire life. I started being involved in esports about 10 years ago but as a viewer. I threw a game called StarCraft II. Are you very good at it? I'm probably the best one in this room, but (laughs) (laughs) in in the esports world, uh, no. I I mean, I was a diamond, so it's just a a, a classification of players. I'm okay, let's say, but uh, far from being a professional player. But yeah, I started watching it because I was playing it, which is a journey that is extremely common amongst esports fans. They play a game and then they know that there is an existing competitive professional scene and they start watching. So I started watching with StarCraft 2 about 10 years ago and I started my company at United Esports about two years ago in 2018. I did all my career in media and marketing, and I wanted to bring my skills that I had developed throughout my life through my passion, which is esports and gaming. And then what need do you feel your company is filling? The truth is the esports audience is probably the best audience from a marketing standpoint. It's 18 to 34, is it's higher income, it's extremely engaged. But esports can seem a little bit, and gaming can seem a little bit, opaque from the outside. So we started the company with the mission of helping brands that are not traditionally associated with esports get into esports. And I'm proud to say that now we also help brands within gaming and within esports develop their identities and create their media. What would you say uh, for your company was maybe the easiest thing from starting it and the hardest thing? So the company is built on a the premise that We took, uh, you know, I started by recruiting people that all had a successful career in media and marketing and a passion for gaming and esports. And honestly, it's a great team. But the easiest thing is to be with people that are all like-minded and you can crack a bunch of jokes about the games, talk about the games all the time. And, you know, when when we're working long days and it's like, 
let's pause for 10 minutes and play a game. So the fact that we have the shared common passion is excellent. And, uh, you know, the cherry on the cake on that side is that we're playing a part in just a little bit influencing how the industry is is moving. So that's probably the, the best element to really be completely immersed with people who have that shared passion and something we're so in love with because I said passion about seven times. And I think that's what makes us good. You know, the gamer is everything, you know, but ignorant to its culture and everything but not engaged. I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes, most of them false. You know, gamers are 16-year-olds living in their parents' basement. I mean, if you look at the statistics of the audience we talk to, just from a numerical standpoint, you can see they're extremely um, great. And the way they react to marketing and media messages is frankly quite different from uh, other audiences. Having worked in influencer marketing, having worked a little bit in radio. How different would you say it is? The truth of the matter is this, is when you do well, you do very well. Uh, and when you do unwell, there's a chance to do quite unwell. The important thing on that second point, that's, that's what's led some brands at first to be a bit scared because they don't want to have the bad rep, etc. But there's many brands that have started on the wrong foot in esports and have turned it around 180. So it's just an engaged audience. People are passionate about esports. Some, you know, in the same way that a lot of s traditional sports fans are passionate about their sports, it becomes a part of their identity. So then what is the biggest challenge for your company? Obviously, the, the challenge is more a challenge that's For the industry, I mean, there is still, I'd say, the challenge to combat progressively the, the negative stereotypes around gaming, around gamers. Uh, There's a lot more women getting involved. Yeah, absolutely, actually. So the statistic, that's a really interesting statistic, actually. First of all, last year, for the first time that I know of, a major esports event was won by a woman. Because most uh, esports are, you know, you can compete uh, uh, regardless of your gender and regardless of your size and many things. I mean, a lot of people say it's a great equalizer. You know, everyone knows and that there will be esports superstar that have, you know, physical disabilities and so on, because it is truly, uh, again, the great equalizer. It's fantastic. People find it, I find it amazing. But uh, that also kind of opens up that people can specifically market to a very, like a niche group of people. Absolutely. They're all so different. And that's one of the things we do, you know, I'm proud to say every week. It's we come in and say, okay, cool. You want to talk about an esports audience? Well, first of all, esports is huge. So if you want to blanket the entire esports market, you can. It's going to take a lot of money. Well, let's say a company decides they want to get involved in esports marketing. So what would you like if they come to you? What's their first step into? It seems kind of from an outsider's point of view, if they don't know much about it, sure. like how do they figure out? where they should go with this, like what areas to yeah. go to. How do you help them That's to figure that out? A common mistake is to take content that is playing on national TV, targeting the whole family from 16 to 65, and broadcast it to a very particular esports audience and expect them to react like the general public. They may, they also may not. So that is some problems we may, uh, not problems actually, these are some pre-existing conditions we might see in some of our customers. And here it's about reframing which aspect of esports makes the most sense for them. Would you ever tell a client that esports just isn't for them? Absolutely. I mean, generally speaking, it's more like, are 18 to 34 is your core demographic? If yes, esports. If no, is it 25 to 45? Okay, cool, esports. But if it's a bit older, generally not. Uh, it's just that esports... You know, the truth of the matter is that 75% of esports fans are between 18 and 34. 10% are over 34, so, and 15% are uh, below. And you're saying that the 18 to 34, they have a lot more money than people are giving them credit. Yeah, I mean, so not only this, but esports 18 to 34 are richer than non-esports 18 to 34. Uh, That's interesting. Yeah. Now, how did the Louis Vuitton, they they partnered with League of Legends. Like how, to me, I would think there's no way, like how does Louis Vuitton fit into the esports at all? I, I love to talk about that topic, actually. That's literally one of my favorite partnership events in esports of the last few months. We've updated our timeline of important events in esports with that actually last week. So all this to say that why, it's because Louis Vuitton and League of Legends 
have the exactly matching uh, overlapping demographic. And it's a question that, uh, you know, people, um, especially in the U.S., will wonder why it worked. But the truth, I mean, that seems shocking to me that their demographic the, is so young. Yeah, I mean, their demographic is almost an exact match. Why? They created in-game assets that talk directly to their young customer. Louis Vuitton has a fairly young customer base, and that's the main difference between the people who buy Louis Vuitton and what they see as new markets and mm -hmm. their traditional markets as their age. So it's a young brand in those markets, and so is League of Legends. So they created in-game assets, but also a physical collection of fashion items around League of Legends, and they sold it out in less than 24 hours. Wow. So it's an extremely successful partnership, and it's very intelligent because it's just matching audiences that are almost exactly the same to start with and giving them what they want. So I think it's for companies or people listening that you may be surprised at how much the esports community could be a part Absolutely. of your market. What's so smart about that collaboration is, you know, they didn't even ma only make a, you know, X amount of thousand dollars handbag. They also made, a, and I don't remember the price, but it's a couple of dollars, you know, in-game assets. So your character in League of Legends can be dressed in Louis Vuitton. So basically anyone can participate. It's not right. only for, you know, the, the, the richest that can afford a Louis Vuitton everything. It's really... Fantastic in the sense that it's a true, full integration over the market. So, yeah, well done, Riot and Louis Vuitton. That was really good. Are there any other uh, campaigns or things you've seen in esports that you're like, oh, I wish I was a part of that? I love that one. Honestly, the Louis Vuitton one is the, the most interesting one. We like to do uh, a lot of things that target new demographics, as you were mentioning earlier. I think that, you know, not just a little outside of the question, one thing that I saw that I was not involved in and that United wasn't involved in that was really important for us is when uh, Bud Light heavily invests in esports. Why? Because we keep on talking about the, and rightfully so, the stereotype of the gamer being 16 in his basement. Alcohol companies are pretty strict on who they advertise to. And, you know, anyone here listening that works in marketing knows that there's usually, I think it's 71.6% or something or 0.9 needs to be above 21 to uh, be advertised to. So by Bud Light saying, cool, we're investing in esports, it shows that they know and they show everyone that they know it's an old enough audience, that it confirms those statistics that we've been saying about their age and, their, uh, and how valuable they are. Mm -hmm. And it allowed us to unlock a great amount of conversations and, and partnerships simply because people are like, okay, cool, Bud Light's going to take the risk. Their legal team is probably extremely well buckled up. We're good. Let's go. So I think that was another key event for us, although it was... Uh, not as uh, sensational as the Louis Vuitton League of Legends partnership. From a marketer standpoint, it held an eno enormous amount of value in unlocking possibilities. Have there been any campaigns that you've seen that really you thought maybe would be great but tanked that yeah. you learned from? I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to go and say, these guys suck. <laughs> but, uh, there well, I guess can you say without saying uh, camp certain campaigns, but... Can you say what was the fail of something? Sure. Just the, the term we like to use around the office is uh, based around a meme called Hello, Fellow Kids. But it's the idea that people try to talk to the kids. Like uh, talk down to them? So the meme is Steve Buscemi with a backwards hat, a skateboard on his, on his shoulder, and it says, Hello, Fellow Kids. It's about, you know, people are out of touch trying to pretend they're in touch with the youth uh, and failing to do so. And it's not only a youth versus non-youth thing here, but it is trying to speak gamer without being a gamer. The, the entire premise behind our team is that we are actual gamers and we are actual esports fan. And I think most of us are comfortable in saying that we are nerds and geeks. Like we are, although a lot of really esports... Really cool nerds and geeks. I mean, the truth of the matter, and I shouldn't say this because a lot of esports fans are not nerds and geeks. There's an enormous proportion of people who watch esports without being nerds and geeks. It's just an element of culture and media now that tr transcends nerddom. But the campaigns that fail 
are the ones that it's an interesting thing actually it feels less sometimes to just take an ad from TV and say okay this is the ad we show everyone and we show it to you guys that's all right what has failed the most is obviously the things that try to be connected to the culture and are so completely off that fails i mean that's not you know only in esports i'm sure you see that in everything but anything again that is close to the chest for its audience getting it right is quite important and i would imagine even generically in marketing it's really knowing your audience but i yeah, would say absolutely. in esports because it's such a passionate very specific type of community that you really need to either know what you're doing or hire somebody who knows exactly where you're taking your message sure and it's a great place to have fun honestly the the cool thing is esports are built around competition and fun so from a content standpoint it's a great place to have fun in So uh, I think a lot of people have a good time when they get into esports because you can really explore new possibilities. You can and have fun with your marketing. Yeah, absolutely. Which, in all fairness, you should in most types of marketing. Right. You know, I did non esports marketing for a while, and the one that's fun is usually better. Where do you see esports going? Like it's expanding so quickly. Yeah. So where do you see? I mean, I've even seen things saying. You know, Netflix and Amazon are going to have to, you know, they, they've captured so much of people streaming their stuff sure. that esports is actually becoming a competitor to, to even them. But that's actually a great quote. It started with that quote from the, the Netflix shareholder. It is, we compete and lose to Fortnite more than HBO. And I'm paraphrasing. Uh, right. Gaming is honestly one of the most legitimate forms of entertainment in the world, if not the most. I talk about it quite frequently, living in Hollywood, socially, you know, you meet a lot of people that say, well, gaming, it's, you know, why don't they go play outside, etc. things like that. It's a ridiculous opinion. I mean, first of all, esports and gaming, really, which incorporates esports in certain elements, is bigger than music and Hollywood combined. And it's safe. And as we mentioned, it's the great equalizer everyone can enjoy. It's a truly social experience. And from an esports as an entertainment uh, medium, I think, you know, it's going to reach very soon a point where it is on par, if not bigger, in traditional sports. In our office, we frequently talk about the fact that people that have kids nowadays that watch esports, their kids grow up watching esports more or exclusively compared to traditional sports. So, you know, I was born a Montreal Canadiens fan. Three generations, if not four. You know, from the day I was born, I was a Canadiens fan. But this exact concept is happening now with esports. There's millions of people right now that are relatively small, but were born in esports. And when they are adults, it will have an equal, if not more important place in their psyche than traditional sports. What would be comparable to the Super Bowl of esports? So League of Legends World Final is bigger than the Super Bowl worldwide. The beauty when in esports and similarly to traditional sports is that there is a bunch of them. So you also have the International, which is a different game that is extremely viewed by tens of million, if not hundreds of million. You have all these elements. So a personal belief, and I don't know how shared it is in the esports industry, is that the esports doesn't exist yet. I think that there are games or a game or a couple of games that are going to come out in the next few years that are going to really trump everything else that exists in esports through their unifying power. The only challenge, in my opinion, to esports growth or the main challenge is that some of them, not all, are fairly complicated to understand if you don't play the game. Not all of them, but that is if you watch... Soccer, for example, the world's most popular sport, it's pretty easy. Guys run after the ball, they kick it in the goals, and you understand what the winning events are. In some esports, it's not quite the case. And there are some that are extremely simple, but they're not very they're not as deep in terms of strategy and skill and enjoyment. And then you have the ones that are extremely deep that are much harder as a spectator sport. I see no reason why there will not soon be an esports that couples both of these elements ease of watching and very deep game complexity, but at several levels. And is your whole life surrounded by esports? Is your girlfriend involved in esports? 
She is not involved in esports, <laughs> but she watches a lot of esports, probably uh, a mix of against her will and, <laughs> and, and, and willingly. But at the office, we, <laughs> we, we watch about 12 hours of esports a day. So, wow. I'm, I'm, How do you get any work done? I mean, we leave it, you know, it's like going to a bar and you have 17 TVs playing <laughs> three or four or seven different games. You know, they get the games play and we, and, uh, and we do our work. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people are typing away or having a discussion and someone will be like, wow, that was great. And the beauty of Twitch and our platform is that we go and we rewind it and say, oh, yeah, that was pretty good. And then we all go back to what we're doing. How do you make an ad or marketing campaign that is as fun to watch as the game? The truth of the matter is that you do one that resonates well with the audience. What we really like to do, and you know, I think uh, we're, we don't have the monopoly in making good uh, gaming or esports content, but I th what we like to do is to actually create something real. You know, there, there are stories and so on, but we like to create events, we like to create experiences, we like to create encounters, and we use that as a, a, a basis for our ideation and sometimes even content creation. So it has a true connection to, to the real. That's honestly a thing we do frequently and we're quite known for. I feel like in some ways people could overthink what they need to do to get involved in esports. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you, and that's, that's a great point. I mean, the idea is that, yes, there are different communities, and yes, you need to do it correctly. Yes, you need to do it in the right place. But there are many codes of, you know, most of us, a lot of us that work at United Esports are marketers or people uh, from Hollywood or content production and so on. There's many codes that apply. It's not, you know, voodoo. It's just doing content, doing great dig uh, digital ads for people in a different market. Granted, there are a few other things that exist only in esports, but the rest is really mastering the community and just having fun with it, honestly. Esports are made for fun. I mean, they're based on games. So There's a lot of passion there. It's a topic I've been passionate about my entire life. And the truth is, we talk about a, a few of us in the office are in our early or mid-30s, And it wasn't cool to be a gamer when we grew up. And now it's pretty damn cool. So it's super interesting for us, especially to see in Gen Z the extreme positive. Like people are starting to catch on to the positivity of gaming. We're happy to be in it. We all want to stay ahead of the marketing curve. So we want to future-proof our businesses. So what should we be looking out for in esports marketing and media? I have to answer this a little bit philosophically, but the truth of the matter is I generally don't believe uh, whether it might be an esports or not esports that is a perfect future proofing to any business. Most things are meant to go away. Overall, I'd say that what's important is to maximize the time whereby a business is relevant. So I think the closest thing to this in esports, and it's not only in esports, it's anything that is culturally significant, is to be associated as a brand with that culture. Right now, it's still possible to get in and get a semi-early foothold in the market because there's a lot that's already been done, but a semi-early foothold and be associated with the values and the lifestyle that is esports and gaming um, for as long as possible. But ultimately, a brand that does very well sticks for one generation. Few are the ones that stick for more. So. As marketers, we have to be okay with that. And, you know, we should all probably retire really quickly to keep relevant. <laughs> How should our listeners use esports marketing to build their brand? The cool thing in esports, and we said a lot has been done already, but there's really a lot of esports communities. And some are less served from a marketing standpoint than others. And like any other marketing, sometimes it's better to be by far the biggest fish in a smaller pond than the smallest fish in a smaller pond. You've been considered an innovator. Do you have any t-shirts that say, I am an innovator? <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you think made you that? Like, what has brought you to where you are now? How have you thought differently than others? I don't know if I, you know, I, I might answer this slightly to the side. I think what keeps us good at what we do is the fact that we think about it all the time. I think that we try and change it. I think as a marketer, if your offering is the same than it was six months ago, you're not doing it right. So it's a matter of really keeping in touch with what's what's new and what could be interesting. I mean, you have to take 
an amount of calculated risk, try things out. But ultimately, as marketer, if we're not also making trends, if we're just trying to to follow what's going on, we're not doing our jobs correctly. I think innovation in our spaces comes from a place of need. So ultimately, innovation should come from need rather than, in my opinion, at least in my life, I think there's better innovators than me by far, far, far. But in, in my life, it's always come from a position of um, from need and trying to do things just just 1% better every day. From a marketing standpoint, then, what would you say is the best content for esports? Esports is super rich. There's extremely talented streamers and gamers. I'm sure that, you know, a lot of people read about them all the time. So you can create content that is immediately connected to the audience and with them and have the immediate response for what they call the chat on the streaming services. So, you know, you broadcast something and everyone's like, wow, that's cool. Oh my God, that sucked. So that's one of the number one feedback loop in esports is that the audience is always there. There is uh, an opportunity to create uh, AAA content when you talk about, you know, we make content that will be served as pre-rolls on Twitch or pre-rolls on Mixer, YouTube gaming, etc. This is more similar to what you would see as a pre-roll on anything else. But here we're really using our team's expertise to create content that will resonate well with those audiences. There is content that is event-based content in the sense that there, I mean, these are sporting events, right? We're, you're going to have 20,000 people show up. What are they going to do? They, they can sit and watch, and you can also entertain them in a really rich manner. And we do that a lot in our campaigns that echoes a feeling of games in general, like jumping and hitting a box, you know, and a coin comes up. Everyone knows what game it's about. But you can also have the wizard and its potions and so on. So generally speaking, creating that high-touch content is something we like to do a lot. Do you think that with Facebook streaming, do you think that they are going to be a competitor to Twitch? Yeah, absolutely. The idea is this, is that Twitch was for a bit of time kind of the uncontested gaming streaming platform and now there's been a few others like caffeine and uh, there's brands in asia etc but let's say in north america the main three competitors right now would be uh, facebook gaming youtube gaming and mixer twitch is still growing because streaming is growing so twitch's relative market share is decreasing but their actual numbers are still, from what I'm told, uh, increasing. So I believe that it will reach a point. I'd be surprised if in the very foreseeable future, Twitch loses market dominance. But I think it's actually really good that there is entrance. I mean, uh, you know, I think... I mean, competition's always great to make everybody step up. Uh, Absolutely. And for us, on top of it, for marketers, for, you know, we do media buying for a lot of our clients, gaming, media buying... It's great that we have four places to buy instead of one. How should our listeners use esports marketing to build their brand and also for esports marketing to be used as a brand moat, as we, the title of this podcast, that we want to defend the brand? The first thing that comes to mind is a differentiator. If none of your competitors are targeting esports audiences and by capturing that audience have a a great leg up your competition. If all of your competitors are targeting esports, first of all, if uh, the varied marketing managers of these brands are doing their jobs okay, they would segmentify esports and pick their hero segments that are most relevant to their brand identity. There's some industries where everyone's quite the same, but in most goods, there's a level of of brand differentiation. So they would pick the right brands that are appropriate to their their brand, the right esports and communities that are appropriate to their brand and leverage that. And obviously right now, one thing we're seeing is a huge land grab. There's really smart marketers that, you know, capitalized on the fact that they were the only ones in their category in esports and they bought a ton of inventory. So that is... I don't know if it's a moat, but it's at least a catapult or a trebuchet overtaking that market. It's a very offensive strategy uh, rather than defensive. I'm assuming that these marketers are start very aggressively by taking as much as possible and then might create product SKUs within the games, product SKUs that are uh, related to gaming and esports and so on. And that would be more of a moat because they have a, I mean, intrinsic, I guess, association between that esports and their brand. So 
right now, I think it's time to be aggressive. Once your aggressive strategy goes well, I mean, it'll be time to build a moat. But as, as we mentioned early in the beginning, it's not the first stage of esports, but it's really not that far down. Maybe bottom of a second, top of a third. So it's time to be aggressive, capture a good segment of the esports market, um, and then, uh, then we'll build a, a good moat. But first mover advantage means a lot. Right. Be an innovator. Well, thank you so much for coming by, Felix LaHaye from uh, United Esports. Well, thank you so much for having you. me. I appreciate you listening to my passion about esports. I hope I it was it. remotely interesting. <laughs> That's our show. Hope you enjoyed it. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is brought to you by Loomly, the brand success platform that helps your team collaborate, publish, and succeed all in one place. Check out Loomly.com and start your free trial now. Thanks for listening. I'm Julie Slater.